Hey, buddy, what's up? Hey, man, I'm at the store and uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be late for the Christmas Eve planning meeting because there's this kid. There's this kid in front of me. He's been like counting pennies for what seems like years. Was Michael supposed to be at this meeting? I, I mean, it, it might have come up in like casual conversation. There's he he cornered me in the hall. He started pitching bits. He's the lead pastor. What what do you want? I'm the new guy. Hey, bud, listen, uh, we're wrapping it up here. I honestly, I don't think you need to, to get here. No, 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 no. I, I'm serious. I'm going to make it, okay? You need me there, okay? Right. All right. Bye. You know what? Just, uh, well, just just put his on mine. Thank you, mister. Did, 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 did. Social distance, okay? Practice it. M Merry, Merry Christmas. I just think we need to find a way to make this Christmas Eve service special, you know? It's, 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 it's been a hard year for everyone. We're not able to gather. Like, it just needs a little something more. It can't just be another online gathering. We have to really go all out. Guys, I am so sorry I'm late, seriously. So tell me, what have you, uh, what have you been talking about? What do you have planned so far? Hey, Michael, uh, we were just brainstorming ideas. We want to make Christmas special. That's what you have, special? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, thankfully I'm here so we can work with that. Uh, special. Christmas special. That's it! Guys, a DCC Christmas special. It's going to be unbelievable. What, yes. what even is a DCC Christmas special? You know, like co comedy bits and, uh, well, music. I mean, like, you know, music. And uh, celebrity guests, yes. We're gonna have celebrity guests. Celebrity guests. Yes, Chad. I mean, I don't go around telling everybody who I know, but I, I know a lot of people. People that would make you freak out. You'd freak out if you knew who I knew. I don't know, Michael. That feels like a lot of extra work. Did somebody say comedy bits? <laughs> who invited John? So sorry I'm late, guys. I'm thinking puppets. Yes, and you know what? We could have a baby Jesus puppet. And, uh, hang on, on Christmas morning, he becomes a real boy. Guys, we did the puppet thing. The people loved it. No, they did not. We swore we would never do that again. Except, except on, except on Christmas, <laughs> right? Michael, it's a hard no on the puppets. Okay. Well, apparently you hate puppets, which is fine. And uh, I hope you don't hate the baby Jesus puppet. Guys, there's literally nothing worse than churches trying to do comedy. Thankfully, I have a lot of other ideas here. Let me see what I have. Oh, okay. The first one, imagine fade in from black and I float down dressed like an angel. So great. Okay, well, apparently that one doesn't seem to be landing with you. Let me see what else I, oh, okay, more angel stuff. So I'm in my bed, I'm sleeping, and an angel visits me in the dream and says, do the DCC Christmas special. And John, John's the angel. All right, so here's what I'm picturing. Michael, I like lower myself down from above you, and I'm watching you sleep, all right? Ew, John, gross. What? Here's another idea. Okay, I'm Santa Claus. Michael, you do the teaching from my lap. Yes. Hello, friends. It's good to be with all of you on Christmas Eve online. Stop, 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 stop. We are not doing this. This is insane. Hey everyone, sorry I'm late. One goat, as promised. Get out. You get out of here. Leave the goat. Michael, you are gonna teach. John. Again? Yes, John, you are gonna do the welcome. Can you handle that? Can I handle it? And welcome to the Denver Community Church Christmas Special. I'm your host, Jonathan Gettings Esquire, and it is great to have you here. Cut. Uh, a couple things, John. Um, this is a family program, so 
You can't be smoking and drinking. Yeah, totally. I mean, okay. bubble pipe and uh, apple juice. Secondly, you're not the host, as we've discussed on multiple occasions. Is that what we ended on, though? Or mm -hmm. well, uh, agree to disagree. And third, where where are you supposed to be from? Well, English Cockney, kind of specifically, just a chance to, to draw uh, people you, into the you're story. You're like the guy they cut out of Harry Potter because he's just bad. Okay, let's just let's just do it. We'll keep it normal. Keep it like typical John stuff. Okay. All right. I mean, normal's a little boring, but. We'll give it a shot. Cool. Okay. Back to one. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. And welcome to the Denver Community Church Christmas special. Cut. Santa? You're doing Santa stuff? Yeah, I just thought like this needed to be like christmas fine. No, you know John, what I mean? Just no, like really no. bring in that feel. You're a pastor. Pastor stuff, okay? We don't need all the extra, just baseline John. All right, connect, just keep it straight. Great, back to one. Good evening. Welcome to the Denver Community Church Christmas Special. Cut. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to the Denver Community Church. Cut. Good evening, you guys, and welcome to the Denver Community Church Christmas Special. This is the night. Cut. Hello. And Cut. Good evening, and welcome to the Denver Community Church Christmas Special. Cut. I think we got it. All right. I thought it was real. I thought it was real great, you guys. I thought it was really coming together. Do you guys like it? No, una mas. No, nothing more. No, we got it. We more got of the it. magic. Okay. Yeah, I thought there was a solar section, but. Oh no! Yeah, no, we got it. We're uh, we're done. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Denver Community Church Christmas Special. While we so deeply wish that we were all together in our uptown location, celebrating Christmas with music, decorations, hugs, and candlelight, we hope that this Christmas special brings you some hope, wonder, and peace, and even joy as we celebrate this wonderful day together from home. Know that even as we spend this cherished holiday apart from our community, our loved ones, our friends, and families, that our hearts are with you. As we celebrate the birth of our Savior, God incarnate with us. May we remember the one who came helpless into a cold world, born among livestock into an uprooted young family. The one through whom all things were made, lying in a bed of straw. Our God is no stranger to discomfort. And just as he entered into our worldly pain on that night so many years ago, so he is with us now in all that we are experiencing in this season together. From all of us to you, welcome and Merry Christmas.
Christmas. My name is Scott Opliger. I'm one of the DCC's neighborhood pastors. And right now I'm standing in the safe outdoor space in the parking lot of our uptown building, which has been created as a place for our neighbors experiencing homelessness in this season to find rest, warmth, safety, and, and even community. As we turn toward the nativity story in which we find a family with no place to stay, giving birth to their firstborn Jesus, God incarnate, in the only space that was available, may we remember that God saw fit to be born into this world in a stable, a barn, the place that was available. Emmanuel, God with us, is perhaps most beautifully expressed in this image, the God of the universe dwelling among us in the humble space that was made available to an uprooted teenage mother and her husband. May we seek to find God in these spaces and may we seek to be the body of Christ to those in our midst who find themselves in places not so different than the stable where he was born so many years ago. Now let's read this passage from Luke chapter two. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. As we continue celebrating Christmas together, know that all we do in and through DCC is only possible through your generosity. If you'd like to learn more about giving or to give a gift to support DCC and our local and global ministries, you can text Denver Church to 77977 or visit our website, denverchurch.org. And now, back to the DCC Christmas special. Oh, hey, Maggie, thanks so much for being here. I'm so glad you could come help me decorate. Uh, Michelle, I am a little bit confused. You told me that we were decorating for the biggest birthday celebration ever, and you look like you were doing an impression of Buddy the Elf. <laughs> well, technically, we are setting up for the biggest birthday celebration ever. Uh, Christmas is Jesus' birthday. Why didn't you just tell me that we were setting up for Christmas instead of telling me that we were setting up for a birthday party? I have a three-tier birthday cake waiting in my car. I don't know. Christmas is such a special holiday that we celebrate, but it does mean so much more. I mean, it is Jesus' birthday, and it means a lot. Like, well, actually, let's hear what our friends have to say about it, because we just found out what Jesus' birthday means to them. To me, it means joy and peace and hope and love in everyone's heart and everyone's happy and having a fun time. It's like his birthday, so like it's a celebration. Everybody celebrates a birthday, don't they? Hope and joy. Jesus says birthday. Yeah. It makes me fall asleep and it makes me get happy. Giving gifts to everyone and um, spending time with my family. He showed us how to be kind and caring and he, it's just, we're celebrating this time for him. Happy, uh, lovely, and uh, a winning pre presents. Um, Christmas! What'd she say? Christmas. <laughs> Jesus' birthday means happiness and love and the time to celebrate. Hope is given to us and everything will be okay. Jesus' birthday means to be spending time with my friends and my family. And it's when he was born. <laughs> Happy birthday to Jesus. walked in a long journey and it was Mary and the baby and its dad and that's, it. that's what it means to me. That's the day when Jesus was born, so that's why it's so special. So that's why I like it the most, holiday, I like it. That was so much fun to see so many of our friends. I really miss them. 
I know, I miss them so much. They gave some really great answers. I mean, Christmas is about the really fun things like hot chocolate and sledding. And the gingerbread cookies and the hot cocoa and the cookie exchanges and like the cookies and the cookies. And also like usually the parties and the presents and the stockings. Yeah, I can get caught up in all of those things. So, I mean, it's crazy that when I think about it, Christmas is actually more of a birthday celebration than anything else. So thank you for the reminder, Michelle. Jesus' birthday is so amazing and something that we get to remember and celebrate year after year. I mean, people came from all over the place to bow down and worship him, even when he was just a tiny baby, because they knew that that tiny baby was a symbol of hope for the whole world. Jesus came into this world to show us the very best way to live. I mean, he showed us what it means to follow him and love everyone and be a healing presence in this world, just like he was. That doesn't mean that we can't break into that cake from my car, does it? Of course we can eat that cake. We're not going to let that go to waste. But first, we have to figure out how to get this star on top of this giant tree. All right, kids. Get ready to sing along, grab a drum if you can. Parents, apologies in advance. Come, they told me the rum bum bum. bum. A newborn king to see the rum bum bum. bum. Our finest gifts we bring. To lay before the king Nick, Nick, what are you doing? Little Drummer Boy, what are you doing? That's not Little Drummer Boy, and you know that. Somehow you were both too big, also too small. That sounds hard to do. I think you're telling me I did a good job. It's not a compliment. The scholars maintain this is actually the way it was played the night Jesus was born. No, I feel like you're patronizing me. It's patronizing, but Hannah, what do you think? I, I just think we're going for the less is more less approach. Is, less is more, less is more. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that works for like wallpaper, for drums, that's not how it works. But, you know, is that what you're trying to say, Chad? Yeah. Less is more. Yeah, you know, I mean, do you want? No, no, no. You still do that, but let's just you, let's just do everything you guys want to do. That's fine. I mean, yeah, let's just do it. Let's do less. Less is more. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Come, they told me the rum bum bum. A newborn king to see. Our finest gifts we bring To lay before our king What are you doing? Less. You're being a baby. No, there's one baby, baby Jesus. I don't think you understand. We have so much to shoot. Shoot, shoot. Do whatever you want. Uh, hey guys, quick thought, um, take it or leave it. It's for the kids, right? The song's called Little Drummer Boy. So like, I say we let Nick go to town. Like this is his moment. Like this is, like let's go big or go home, right? Like Nick, I love what you were doing that first time. It's for the kids, Chad. Seriously, Dan. Hey, Chad. Guess what? What? I've got a fever. Oh my gosh. And the only prescription- Dan, how many times do I have to tell you if you have a fever, you can't come into work? That's actually true. It's a figure of speech, guys. Nick, this is your show, buddy. I want you to give it to me. Big time. Okay. All right? Seriously? Don't hold back. You got it, man. Trust me. Cut. Cut. 
Dan, this was a huge mistake, okay? We're just gonna do a real song uh, with a real band. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Hope, peace, joy, and love. Four candles, four promises continually offered to us by God, and all of them manifest in the one that we light tonight, the Christ candle. Christ our hope, Christ our peace, Christ our joy, Christ our love. 
Christ, our hope. In you, Jesus, we have hope for healing and restoration, hope for change and transformation, our hope, our light born into the darkness. Christ, our peace. In your presence, Lord, we're invited to be still and know that you hold everything, to know that we are held by you. You wrap all of the chaos, all of the hurry, all of our worry and fear in your arms and offer rest. You offer peace in you. Christ, our joy. You, Lord, created us because you delight in us and your delight gives us joy. Jesus, you are the gift. You're the joy that fuels our hearts and brings light into our lives. Christ, our love. We can only love because you loved us first and have shown us what love is. You, Lord, are our acceptance, our belonging, our affirmation. You, Lord, are our love. Christ, our hope, Christ, our peace, Christ, our joy, and Christ, our love. Friends, may our eyes be open to see and may our hearts be ready to receive the coming King. May our lives be the stables into which the Savior is born. May we be people where the hope, peace, joy, and love of God are cultivated internally and then birthed into the world each and every day so that a very weary world would rejoice. May it be so. Hello, everyone. It is good to be with you online this Christmas Eve. We are on the brink of Christmas, preparing to say once again, even so, come Lord Jesus. Now this day is one of the highest and holiest days on the church calendar, second only to Easter. This is why many gather together with friends and families and make plans and often attend a candlelight service as a part of their celebration. And meanwhile, churches are busy anticipating the crowds and people pack into church buildings around the country to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Christmas carols are sung. There's a reading from Luke chapter two and attenders are led in an Advent liturgy. And of course, there's a sermon or homily given by a pastor, which is what we're doing here. And while for many, it may seem like just another sermon, it is not the same for preachers. Preparing the sermon for Christmas has traditionally been a big deal. Many years ago, I would talk with other preachers and we would talk about what we were planning to say, comparing notes and sharing insights in the hopes that we would be more prepared to give a sermon when Christmas rolled around. There was an unspoken pressure to make the Christmas sermon like really, really good because, well, it's Christmas and we have to give the people their money's worth. Now, I'd be lying if I told you I never felt this pressure. It was pressure, of course, that I placed on myself. In seasons past, as the day drew closer, I would wonder, what am I going to say? And I would sit and I'd plot and I'd plan and I'd adjust and I'd make edits and then I'd make more edits, trying to make the sermon perfect because I believed I had to say something. But what I've learned over the years is the belief that I have to say something simply isn't true. Now, here's why I say that. One of the privileges of my job is that people often invite me into the sacred and holy space of their pain. Over the years, I have walked with couples who are in crisis. I have stood with with families in a hospital room as their loved ones passed from this life. I have held the hands of parents experiencing sorrow as they watched their child in the throes of addiction And I've been in homes with families when one of their family members received a terminal diagnosis from their doctor. And every single time I'm invited into these moments, I have a deep sense that I'm standing on holy ground. Now, early on in my work, I believed I was invited into these spaces because others believed I could offer some kind of insight or uncommon wisdom or speak the perfect words that would bring clarity or comfort or a measure of relief. I believed I was actually supposed to say something. I mean, why else would they call me? You know, I'm a pastor, the one with all the answers. So when I received a call, I would drive to someone's house or to a hospital or a funeral home, thinking the whole way, what am I going to say? 
And I was genuine and earnest in my thinking, believing if I could find some words, maybe the right words, they just might bring comfort. But over time, I realized nothing I said seemed to work. In fact, I don't remember a single time when someone said to me, thank you for what you said. Now, there was one particular time nearly 20 years ago, a man named David who was a part of our church suddenly and unexpectedly passed away from a heart attack. Now, I'd gotten to know him and his wife, Carol, really well, and she asked that I perform the funeral. So we set a time for me to visit and I had some things to say. So I arrived at their home, Carol and I sat down and I shared some thoughts and that's when she reached over and she put her hand on mine, politely interrupting me. And in her kind, generous elder wisdom, she said, thank you, Michael. But it's enough that you are here. David would love that you are here. In that moment, Carol was my teacher. Those words, it's enough that you are here, were so helpful. Because in time, I realized others were saying the same things as Carol. What they often said was like, thank you for being here, or thank you for coming over, or thank you for stopping by. Their gratitude was about my presence, not my words. Because there are times when words fall flat. As powerful as words can be, I learned no words can make sense of a terminal diagnosis or lend comfort to grieving parents or share insight that will lead to immediate healing in a marriage or make sense of the death of a loved one. There are times when words don't work. And this year, this year is one of those times when words fail us. I mean, what do we say in the midst of this season, in the midst of our struggle? Last week, I, I went on a walk with my spiritual director. And in the course of our conversation, he said to me, I'm not sure anyone is doing well in this season. And when he said that, I, I thought of how I have approached Christmas in the past, wondering what am I going to say? But, but his comment caused me to ask a different question, not, what am I going to say, but what can I say? Now, I don't know where each of you are personally. What I do know is there's nothing ordinary about these days. A novel virus has upset and upended life as we know it. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives and many who died crossed the threshold from this life into the next without a loved one at their bedside. Countless people have lost their jobs or had to close their businesses and even more are experiencing financial insecurity. Long gone are the, the concerts and the, the sporting events and the community gatherings. The global human community holds a collective sorrow and we are in a deep dive into the unknown, profoundly marked by loss. Now normally in our sorrow and in our grief, we have others to walk alongside of us. We have a village surrounding us, but now, now there's an experience of absence. Many of us have felt the isolation of this season, relegating our connection with others to Zoom calls. We were meant to have engagement with others and ongoing intimacy with the divine, but now there are many moments when that feels lost. And in its place, an emptiness and loneliness visits us. And so I wonder, like, what, what can I say? And the truth is, I don't know. I don't have words. And I don't have words because I do not believe there's any words that can explain this season or, or make sense of all that has swirled in 2020 or magically make this day somehow better for us. I simply don't know. I don't know what to say. And I'm okay with that because there is something I do know. What I do know is this season reminds us that God, for whatever reason, chose not to speak. Rather, God chose presence. This is the story of Christmas. Matthew begins his gospel saying, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus putting on flesh and entering fully into the human experience. And Matthew finishes his gospel recording Jesus' final words when he insists, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. 
And what I know is that somehow, like, like somehow this offers comfort. Keep in mind, Jesus spoke these final words after his crucifixion. And just before his crucifixion, he had a friend betray him and another denied knowing him and the rest of his friends abandoned him, leaving him no one to walk alongside him in the darkest hours of his life. For Jesus, there was an experience of absence. And as Jesus hung on that horrible instrument of torture, in that moment, Emmanuel, God with us, cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus endured his crucifixion alone. Now this is a paradox. Two seemingly contradictory truths existing in the same space. Like Jesus, the presence of God, experienced the absence of God. Scott Erickson writes that the function of a paradox is not to find the solution to seemingly opposite truths, but to be transformed by living in the middle mystery of them. And this is where we find Jesus, God's presence experiencing God's absence. Jesus was suspended between these two contradictory truths as he felt the full weight of that moment. He didn't go around it or avoid it or try to explain it away with words. No, Jesus went deep into the moment and bore the full brunt of suffering. He bore it, as it were, the sins of the world in his body. And he fully experienced every last bit of our sorrow and our grief and our loss. And in this intense suffering, he also felt the pain of God's absence. Maybe this is, maybe this is what makes the presence of Jesus so powerful. Because when we talk about the presence of Jesus, we recognize as the writer of Hebrews claims that we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness but we have one who's been tried and tested in every way, just as we are. Which means when we talk about Emmanuel, God with us, we're talking about a God who is intimately acquainted with our suffering, one who has experienced our pain and felt that sting of isolation, a God who in the person of Jesus shows us that God is with us. This invites us to see even in the moments when hope seems like a distant reality, in the times when we are crushed beneath the weight of sorrow and loss this season has brought to us, when you feel the absence of others and maybe even the absence of God, when you find yourself crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are invited to see right there in that very moment that we find ourselves in the presence of the crucified and risen King whose birth we celebrate tonight. And the invitation, my friends, is, is to trust this presence, to live in the middle mystery of these two contradictory truths, and by doing so, open ourselves to being transformed by them. This is the thrill of hope that leads to the weary world rejoicing. And we are weary, but we can find comfort in this presence, even in the midst of absence. And because of this, we have hope not because we know what to say or have all the right words. No, we have hope because of the presence of the one who sits with us in the midst of this season. We hope because of the divine mystery, the God of the universe who is present with us right here and right now. And so may we see, may we feel, and may we come to know deep in our bones this reality of God's presence and may that May that give us the resolve to say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error binding till he appeared and the soul felt its Thrill of hope, the weary world reaches.
rejoices for yonder
Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As you go, receive this blessing. My brothers and sisters, may you be reminded that the God who is with us, who has been, is, and will forever be with us, invites us to imitate Jesus and his life, and that we as the body of Christ can and should be the presence of Christ right here, right now, knowing that God will work in and through us to see his kingdom reflected and realized in our world. May you know that to be true and co-create with the God who is with us to see this become a reality. Peace be with you. Merry Christmas. 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 Merry Christmas.